Mention America and Islam and most people think of irreconcilable conflict, but I suspect that's not the whole story. In this two-part series, I hope to discover the true relationship that's evolving between the two. There are said to be 8 million Muslims in the United States, and the faith is said to be the fastest growing religion in this country. And the roots and history of Islam are longer than most people are aware of. I want to travel across this huge country to find out the stories of what it's like to be an American Muslim. In this first program, I'll be searching for the origins of Islam in America, talking to African Americans who are just discovering their own Islamic history and exploring if being American fits comfortably with being Muslim. My journey begins with a trip to Minneapolis in the Midwest. It may seem an odd destination for a program on Islam because its citizens are mostly Jewish and Christian. But in 2007, voters here elected America's first Muslim congressman, Keith Ellison. Keith's back on the campaign trail on a most significant anniversary. Today is Juneteenth. It commemorates June 19, 1865, the abolition of slavery. These are local political activists, and they're coming on the parade to get people in this community fired up about voting. And at the heart of their efforts are young Muslims playing their part to try and get Congressman Keith Ellison, the first Muslim in Congress, re-elected. How are you doing? Good to see you, Ronnie. Nice to see you. Keith Ellison is a charismatic politician who's keen to get young Muslims started in politics. Well, you know, we're just having fun out here. Yeah. Keith introduces me to his intern, Cowell. What did you say to sort of young Muslims who are living in other parts of the world who think being a Muslim in America is a very tough thing? Is that true? I mean, there's advantages, there's disadvantages. We definitely have a lot more opportunities. It's kind of difficult growing up in a different, especially where I'm from, it's Wisconsin. I'm the only Muslim in my school, the only Muslim in my high school. So that's definitely a challenge. But once you get past that, you know, you can, there's so many different avenues, so many different opportunities for you to connect with. And what it's like to be a Muslim in the United States, it's challenging and rewarding all at the same time. But I think the most important thing to remember is that you own this. You know what? We can make it all big if we want to. And I encourage all Muslims around the world to actually do the same. You know, please get to know your elected officials, vote, you know, that's the only way you can make a difference. Come on, let's go. Okay, okay. How you guys doing? Happy Juneteenth. You know, this is when the slaves got freed, right? This is a great example of the American art of glad-handing. It's the way to the electoral heart of the nation, how candidates meet their voters, and it's paid off for Keith here in Minneapolis. And it's worked elsewhere. Now, Americans have elected two Muslims to Congress. All these groups that have historically been on the margins of American society now coming in, you know, and there's enough for everybody, yeah. right? Isn't there enough? <laughs> OK. For those Muslims around the world in Western countries who have no idea about the community here, how would you say life is for Muslims in America at the moment, in all walks and areas of life? You do hear about people getting sure. hassled in the airports. Yeah. You know, there's a long way to go. Absolutely. Because the impression most people have, I mean, come from Britain in terms of sure. the Muslims here, is that basically everyone's hiding under their beds. And, Wrong. You know, that's broadly speaking, that Muslims well, are living in this. the belly of the beast. That's well, what they believe. Well, not only did I... Not only did I just get elected by an overwhelmingly exactly. Jewish and Christian yeah. community, so did Andre Carson, yeah. who's That's, Muslim yeah, yeah, in, exactly. in Indiana. So people need to not look for excuses to disengage. Yeah. You have to get involved. Yeah. You have to run the risk that you're going to encounter bumps and, and along the way, but you still but you have, have to, to be seen and heard. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Anytime, right? 
Certainly, Keith needed the votes of Christians and Jews to get elected. But there's a community of 44,000 Somali Muslims here, the biggest in America. They even have their own TV network, and they all got behind Keith. This is Somali TV of Minnesota, and we are so glad to have here today with Raghi Omar from Al Jazeera. OK, Raghi, let's focus to uh, you are Muslim and you are in Europe countries. I think Muslims in uh, European countries um, believe that you know they enjoy the greatest freedoms and the Muslim communities in the West are thriving most of all uh, in Europe. And uh, when they think about uh, the position of, of, of Muslims in, a, in America, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, I think they think that uh, the numbers are tiny. Before I caught the plane here, actually, I was with my mum and I asked her, I said, mum, who are you, as we mm -hmm. say in Somali? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how many Muslims do you think there are in, in the whole of the United States? And she said 100,000, 150,000, you know? Well, the whole United States. In the whole United States. Wow. But I mean, as I understand it, there's anywhere between five and eight million. million. That's the number. I mean, when you think about America as the land of opportunity and sort of seizing things with both hands, maybe the sort of, you know, the, the next Raggy Omars, if I could be so arrogant as to say that, will come from here. Maybe it's you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Raghi. thanks, Thank Raghi. you very much. I have distant relatives in the Somali community here. They were among the first to escape the civil war that's been raging in my homeland off and on for decades. 20 years on, and a new wave of refugees has arrived from Somalia. Some have just graduated college and are throwing a party to celebrate their achievements. We came here to take advantage of the opportunities that are here. At the same time, to keep our identity as Muslims. We're all going through the same experiences. Let's not forget our identity, and let's give back to the community. Nothing like that. I'm a very blessed person, because, excuse me while I get a little bit emotional. Um, we've been given so much, you know, we've gone through so much, but you read the news, it's happening at home. I have nothing to complain about. You know? After that, we need some laughs, so I want to welcome Ali Abdullah to here. Thank you very much. But the problem is I don't speak English. Should I speak Somali, Raghi? Yeah. Better than me. <laughs> Marco, he's a big shot. Make him one million dollar a year. Who knows? Dana, salama, how you doing, mommy? You have to vote for me. Who knows? Portello, hi. Still, how you try? Why? I don't know. My adopted home, England, has a bigger Somali community than Minneapolis, and it's been settled for longer. But they don't tend to think of England as home. My parents are typical. Their mental bags are still packed to return to Somalia. But that's not true here. These Somalis, no less scarred or traumatized by their experiences, have planted roots deeper and faster than any Somali community I've seen in the world. They don't talk of returning home. They are home. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, nice to meet you. Uh, Let's go. Yeah. Come on. How are you? So I'm it's a message that came across loud and clear, and I was still hearing it in the taxi to the airport with Abdi Mohammed. So how long have you lived here, Abdi? It's 13 years. 13 years? Yeah. And you came from in Somalia? Somalia. Yeah. Mogadishu. In Mogadishu? Yep. I was born there. I haven't been there for a long time there. There was a lot of problems last 15, 17 years. Yeah. Yeah. In England, mm -hmm. we Somalis, you know, we're not that organized, you know? Mm -hmm. Here in America, if you don't organize, if you don't vote, yeah. if you don't participate, American way of living, you're lost. Yeah. So you're not bad. That's the way to be visible. That's the way to get heard. Yes. Can you be Muslim and American, Abdi? Yes. Do you have to sacrifice one to be the other? You have to be American first mm. and you have to do what other Americans do you sacrifice your life to defending America because this is our country this is uh, you feel that you I mean you don't think about going back I'll, home I'll sacrifice my life defending this country because the opportunity I get the welcoming I get mm. that's a powerful statement compared to where I come from how we were how I was you know a lot of friend of mine who died the war where we come where I come from coming here you know, having what I have is home. Minnesota is a liberal state in the democratic heartland of the Midwest, a welcoming place for these Somalis, the latest black immigrants to establish themselves in America. 
But in the early years of its history, America was the very opposite of welcoming for the first Africans to reach these shores. For 300 years, Africans were brought here in chains as slave labor. I'm heading to Jackson, Mississippi in the Deep South to meet some of the descendants of those first African Americans, because it seems that their history lies at the heart of the story of Islam in America. This impressive looking building is actually the state capital of Mississippi. And I'll be honest, I've come with my own really strong preconceptions about the South. For me, it's about being in the heart of the Bible Belt, it's about prejudice and a history of segregation. But I've actually been told that the story of Islam in America begins of all places here, centuries before Muhammad Ali or Malcolm X. And it's a story that begins with slavery. It starts here because most of the slaves shipped from Africa came to work the plantations of the South. Among them were Muslims, but they were forbidden by law from practicing their faith. Many of the slaves brought to America were Muslims. Forbidden from practicing their faith, they found secret ways to keep Islam alive. Calling the faithful to prayer here in Mississippi is Abdul Rashid. He believes that one way they achieved this was through music. The Africans brought the music here mm. as slaves. Mm. People saying blues came from Mississippi, I don't think so. I've been hearing about the link between the call to prayer and the songs that slaves used to sing in the fields. How are they similar? The call to prayer. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. If you ever went to a Baptist church, then you can hear this in a Baptist church. Really? All of the uh, Baptists, especially the Southern Baptists, mm -hmm. uh, they start off with a a cappella uh, singing. The whole congregation is singing, you know. I love the Lord, he heard my cry. I, you know, mm -hmm. because the entire Quran was basically chanted in yeah. that sense, you know. And it was chanted basically in that minor scale. You see that connection to you, and you're singing things that are deeply embedded within the sort of African-American experience and the blues. Not only that, but that was one of the things that uh, guided me to Islam. Really? Yes. The music. And when you start reading, when I was introduced to the Quran, that was... Uh, you found it there as well? I found it there as well. So I think, to, uh, for my opinion, now, this is just my opinion, and with my opinion and a dollar and something, you can get a cup of coffee, okay? <laughs> but uh, this is my opinion, that this entire movement is a spiritual movement and is geared towards the Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Abdul, more and more people of all ethnicities are finding their way to Islam. A third of all Muslims in America, about two million, are converts. The people at the mosque in Jackson are convinced that this is having a positive impact on the entire nation. Okola Rashid is one of the founding members here. We're happy to have you. We heard so much about you. you? Uh, yes, your I hope show. you're good. <laughs> all good, all good, and we're just happy to have you. Okolo is involved in a new research project with 25 other historians. They believe their discoveries will not only rewrite the history of Islam in America, but transform our understanding of African cultures. I think we're leading the way, actually. Yeah. As part of this initiative, Okolo founded the International Museum of Muslim Cultures, the first in America. Research here suggests the number of Muslim slaves was much greater than previously thought. One third of all of the enslaved Africans that were brought to the Americas actually were Muslims. Nobody knows this. This is kind of new, cutting-edge information because when we read our history books, we don't see that. We have one of the great stories here in Mississippi uh, in uh, a place called Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, we have the story of uh, 
Prince Abdul Rahman Ibrahim. He was an African Muslim prince and scholar. Came out of the area around Gambia, and he was actually enslaved in Natchez for over 40 years. And we have that story. But, but you're a combination of all these things that's unique here to the, to the Deep South, aren't you? I mean, Africa, American, and Muslim. And why is, the, why is it important to stress, I mean, in this exhibit, in your work, this missing link of Islam in, 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 this, in this mix? The most important reason is that it's going to help the African American to become a first class citizen as mm. opposed to a second class citizen. And this whole standing up for rights, fight for freedom, leading the whole effort in America for reforming America and, and bringing America to respect its own constitution or blending is, is really what's, uh, uh, that's what makes me optimistic about the future. This corner of the exhibition is really interesting because you've got real evidence of this link between Islam and slavery in Mississippi. And Ibrahim Abdurrahman, who was known as the prince among slaves, who was sold into slavery for 40 years before winning his freedom and going to live as a free man in Liberia. And I understand that there are his descendants still living in the United States, and I'm going to try and find them. I now see that what's at the heart of the story of Islam in America is the story of slavery. And on this issue, America was divided. As early as the 1770s, some Americans were calling for the abolition of slavery. One of these, Thomas Jefferson, proposed forming a colony in Africa to take freed slaves. But it wasn't until 1863, after the Civil War, that slavery was finally abolished. With it came the economic collapse of the southern states, which depended on slaves. The big plantations fell to ruin, and two million freed slaves headed for the northern cities. For those who stayed behind, life remained brutal. Well into the 20th century, lynching and murder were everyday facts of life for African Americans across the South. African Americans have been telling me that here in Mississippi, a place I've always associated with prejudice, they can now be Muslim without prejudice, and that this is an essential part of being a Muslim in America, the fight against prejudice and the struggle to be free. And it was in pursuit of this struggle that in the early part of the 20th century, millions of African Americans abandoned the South and they headed north, which is where I'm going next. <laughs> I'm catching the night train to Chicago, following in the footsteps of millions of freed slaves, drawn to the city by the promise of jobs in the factories and stockyards, and above all, with the hope of living a life free from prejudice. But they did have another option, to sail for Liberia, the colony America established for freed slaves in Africa. It was a stark choice, scratch a living in America's ghettos or build a nation from scratch. The Muslim Prince Ibrahim of Mississippi that Okolo told me about was among the first to sail for Liberia, where he dreamt of establishing Islam. But the early settlers encountered little but disease and hardship, and Prince Ibrahim barely saw the completion of the first settlement before he died. Modern Liberia has suffered a succession of civil wars, and fleeing the last of these was Ibrahim's great-great-great-great-grandson, who has turned this story on its head. He fled war-torn Liberia to find freedom in America. His name is Artemis Gay. Yes, that's right. It all started when the civil war started in Liberia. I came to this country, and uh, it was just a sheer sense of understanding my own country's history, that I spent hours in the library just trying to find out the, the history of the colonization from Mississippi to Liberia. And then I did find out, yes, there was a ship, there was a ship manifesto, and on one of the ship's name, I found her great-grandfather's name. His name was Abdul Rahman Ibrahim Suri. Uh, he was one of the sons of uh, Suri Maudu, who was an alimami. He was a prince, but also, clearly by his name, a Muslim. A Muslim. That's very important to realize that he understood science. He understood medicine, and that for me was like 
winning the lottery. Oh, you know, rare. amazing. Yeah. Roots in reverse. Here I have to come from Africa to find my own roots. Here I have to come from Africa to, find, to seek refuge. And I found Chicago as a place, an intellectual place for me, a spiritual home for me, and above all, it has one of the largest collection of books in Africa. You will find nowhere in Africa. It's right here in Chicago. How important was it that Abdurrahman, uh, your relative, was a Muslim? This country has to understand that its roots, especially when it comes to African American, is an Islamic root. African Americans should not see that as just a religion. It should see as part of its heritage. And the good thing about it, people respect each other here. You know, in the midst of all of this, this diversity. So that's something that Chicago has that uh, we will say shows what it means when people in from diverse culture all merge. Artemis has a good point. Chicago is culturally very diverse and it has a large Muslim community, big enough to justify this celebration of Arab culture. It's the second year running the city is celebrating its links with the Middle East. For those former slaves who fled the South a little over 100 years ago, the transformation of this city's soul would be unbelievable. African Americans came to Chicago as part of one of the largest human migrations of the 20th century. They were leaving the segregated and racist South in search of a new life in what many hoped would be a promised land. And it was out of this experience that was born the first American Muslim movement, and it was known as the Nation of Islam. In the 1930s, a radical idea began to spread through the cities of America. The idea that white people were irredeemably evil formed the cornerstone of the Nation of Islam, whose theology combined Islam and black nationalism. The nation's message appealed to African Americans who'd fled the bigotry of the South. By the 1950s, the nation had around 100,000 members, led by Elijah Muhammad. They fooled you by telling you, don't hate no one. You should tell them what the hell have you been doing to me. But what gave the nation some credibility were high-profile members, including the boxer Cassius Clay, who took the name Muhammad Ali, and the radical, charismatic activist Malcolm X. The racialist never understands a peaceful language. The racialist never understands the non-violent language. But in 1965, after leaving the movement, Malcolm X was assassinated. Defection soared, and after Elijah Muhammad died, most of the membership converted to mainstream Islam. Louis Farrakhan attempted to revive the movement and its racial policies in 1981. When they start killing black people wholesale, yeah. nobody cares. Yeah, it's but today, the nation's membership is small, its rituals border on idolatry, and its message is barely recognizable to most Muslims. Challenge white supremacy. I'm on a bit of a pilgrimage south of Chicago to meet a man who's had a profound effect on the story of Islam in America. He's the son of Elijah Muhammad, but he led the largest single conversion to mainstream Islam that America has ever seen. Imam Wallace Dean Muhammad lives modestly here in Chicago. He became the head of the Nation of Islam when his father, Elijah Muhammad, died in 1975. Wallace Dean persuaded most of the nation to adopt mainstream Islam, and he changed the nation's name to the World Community of Islam in the West. There were some very startling mm -hmm. ideas that mm -hmm. uh, the oh, Nation yeah. of Islam had. Yes. I mean, tell us about some it of the a, It was a myth, a myth to destroy. We had a myth of uh, the origins of the white race as the grafted devil of the black man, you know. That's mind blowing, you know. And the, the black people were <laughs> and black people were gods and the whites were devils, essentially. Exactly. Exactly. But what made you break with the nation of Islam then? It like? didn't it didn't take nothing but a child's brain for me to do that. I was about eleven or twelve when I decided that that was wrong. Then you became a Sunni Muslim. Well, I don't make a big deal about Sunni and Shiite, you know. When you I became left, a mainstream Muslim. You became a mainstream Muslim. Yes. And really the importance of it how it would affect not only Muslims, but Christians too, uh, was not realized by us in 1975. 
In what way was it important turning that to mainstream Islam? That the black nationalist movement, as extreme as ours, believing what we believe in the race uh, issue, could make a 180 degree turn and join Muslims of the world, good Christians and other good people of this earth. It's amazing. But when you look from the Middle East or Europe, thinking of America as a, as a bad place to be a, a Muslim, mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like living in the belly of the beast. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard that. How would you say that life is like here for people? Well, we know things have happened to make America appear ugly in the eyes of uh, uh, citizens of this country and the citizens of the world. But if we can see America the beautiful that has advanced against America the ugly successfully, um, then I'm sure that we would recognize that uh, America is the most fertile soil we have for establishing our religion and our future for our children, our grandchildren and children to come. And in my journey across America, if I want to find America the beautiful, um, where will I find that? So mm -hmm. What kind of things should I look for? The concept of citizenry, how citizenry is established um, in the Constitution of the United States based upon the equality of man, and I feel very strongly that the Founding Fathers envisioned a world that would welcome Muslims and others from across the waters, not, just, not only Christians. There seems to be an incredible transformation here. Only 30 years ago, Chicago was the most racially divided city in America. It had a white supremacist movement and a black separatist movement. It saw some of the worst racial violence in the entire country. I'm amazed at what I'm hearing from people like Artemis and Wallace Dean, and it seems Chicago is becoming much more at ease with its own diverse population. It's a rich city where life is improving on many fronts, better public education, calmer race relations, and overall the crime statistics show a big improvement. But there is still a dark side to this city, because even though the city has cracked down and arrested gang leaders, gang violence is getting worse. I've been here for three days and nine people have been killed in gang warfare. Islam has made huge gains in Chicago, which is home to the largest number of African-American Muslims in the US. 30 years ago, they had only one mosque. Today, they have more than 40 to choose from. Now, Islam has a new battle to win, trying to loosen the hold the gangs have on Chicago's south side. This is a brown line train to downtown. I'm heading to the south side to visit the city's first halfway house for Muslim ex-prisoners. Its aim is to provide an alternative to life in the gangs. The man who runs this project has served 12 years for murder. Like many ex-offenders, he converted to Islam in prison. His name is Rafi Peterson. We used to go into Cook County Jail, Division yeah. 11, yeah. which is the, like the maximum security. Yeah. And then um, we seen so many brothers. We did that for like six years. Mm. And then we seen so many brothers coming home and going right back. Right. We realized that we needed more. But the temptation to fall back in must be must have been very high for a lot of people that you've known. As if you come back and you've got to make money, you've got to make ends meet. Not only that, remember a lot of brothers that convert to Islam in the institution. Yeah. They was other than Islam before institution. So we know that you have to have an environment yeah. for the brothers to get a foothold when they yeah. get out. And so we went to National Housing Service. I said, look, Mike, yeah. I know y'all got some houses boarded yeah. up. Yeah. Can we get one? Right. And he said, I know a, a good one. Yeah. You can have one we're having a lot of problems with. And, you know, we can we But can it was in a bad way when Definitely. you s first saw this house. There was graffiti everywhere in here. So this was a gang house? This was a gang house. It right. was boarded up, yeah. and the neighbors and stuff was afraid to say anything or right. to even call the police on these guys. The neighborhood is feeling the benefits of this project, but that's not all. It's having a positive impact on those still in prison. Hassan, are you noticing more and more, I mean, African-Americans coming to Islam, I mean, especially in, in prison? 
they already have it in their self, but they yeah. need somebody to bring it out of them. Mm. So then once they see it, then they might say, oh, yeah, I'd like that. Yeah. This halfway house is a calm center in a neighborhood torn up by gang violence. And Rafi is not content to let murder and mayhem thrive on his doorstep. It was a killing right here in this alley right here. And then we put it right here. About a year ago, they dropped a the brother right here. Mm -hmm. And they shot him in the head. Mm -hmm. This is a very uh, heavily drug-infested area up this street here. They say it's 88,000 young people between the ages of 8 to 25 in this general area that we live in, West Long. It's artesian now. Down this street, I don't want to go down there, especially with the camera in the car. Yeah. There's been several murders unsolved. If you look down the street, the street looked like a yeah. ghost town. Mm -hmm. See all the up houses boarded up. Yeah. Same thing down this way. Campbell, heavily drug infested also. They had a killing on him, 63rd. I wanted to take you up 63rd Street. I mean, you're living right in the heart of it. So you still know a lot of people. Mm -hmm. they, they accept us, you know. They know a lot of the brothers, even a lot of the brothers in the tribes, mm -hmm. they don't like what I'm doing, mm -hmm. but they know I'm going to do what I got to do. Yeah. Two weeks ago, they killed the brother. See where them guys at right there? That's the store that they broke in on the corner. Yeah. They shot that place up. The one thing that they did when they locked up all of the real gang chiefs in Chicago, they destabilized all of the gangs. Now, there's no one individual you can come to like you used to back in the day and say, man, and he got control of a whole area. Yeah. It's a matter of survival. I mean, they got to do what they got to do to survive. I don't knock them, you know, because yeah. I understand where they're at. My thing is, if you want to turn people away, you got to turn them towards something. Yeah. And of course, what Rafi is trying to turn this neighborhood towards is Islam. What do you think, Rafi, here in Chicago, what do you think is Islam's place in America? I mean, is it a growing one? Has it got a healthy future or, or not? I think that Islam can be the cure to America ills if it's openly accepted. Islam can knock down barriers because we, as Muslims, we're supposed to be the best for humanity. And I think Islam in America has opportunity to really teach and show that that's what we are and that's what we can be. I have to admit, I've come to America with my own prejudices and misconceptions. I thought that being Muslim in America was a story of widespread fear, discrimination and stereotyping. But in the short time I've been here, what I'm hearing from Muslims is about opportunity, constitutional rights and due process, about having a stake in this country and being made to feel that they belong. And as I travel across America, what I want to find out is whether these ideas define not only what it means to be a Muslim in America, but what it actually means to be an American Muslim. And I'm getting the message that a great deal of what it means to be an American Muslim is understanding your constitutional rights and how you go about being a good citizen. And it's in Washington, the nation's capital, where I'm hoping to learn about citizenship, the law of the land, and the influence of Islam. You know, hardly anyone would credit the current American leadership with having much knowledge of Islam's history, but that wasn't always the case. In fact, in something that would come as a huge surprise to most of us, amongst the founding fathers, one of the greatest, Thomas Jefferson, had his own Quran in full acknowledgement of Islam's contribution to world civilization. And one of the most famous monuments in the American capital over there is dedicated to him. A big part of the legacy of Thomas Jefferson and the Founding Fathers is freedom of expression. It means a lot to Americans, including American Muslims. One of the most radical ways you can indulge this freedom is on stage through comedy. I'm in Washington, D.C., about to get a lesson in free speech at a comedy club. Show your love for Ruby Nicholas, a first-generation Pakistani Muslim woman. She just won Nick at Night's Funniest Mom in America. Ruby Nicholas won a national talent competition and became an overnight star. My parents lied when they came to this country. They told everyone they were Pakistani Muslim immigrants. 
so that I wouldn't have to grow up with the stigma of being known as Hawaiian. <laughs> this is my mom's explanation of Easter to me and my sisters. True story. Girls, on Easter, the Jesus Christ will come back from the dead and he will give all of the good children toys in the night. <laughs> what? No, I mixed it. Shut up, sit down, shut up. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I mixed it. On Easter, the Jesus Christ will come out of the cave. And if he does not see his shadow, <laughs> There will be six more weeks of chocolate. <laughs> Thanks so much, you guys. I'm Ruby Nicholas. That's my time. So really, you I, literally really, got up that yeah. time and became won that competition. Yes. It so was this is a very, new career now. Yes, it's brand new. It was the very first time I'd ever That's done stand-up, was the audition for that show. Right. Yeah. yeah. And do you ever get Muslims in the, uh, I, I mean, American do. Muslims in the audience? I do. And, um, and there's always a mixed bag reaction. Right. I mean, it? there are yeah. some that really feel as though Close the fatwa the is imminent, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so there are those, you know, yeah. and there are others who just sort of take it yeah. in stride and... But do you think, I mean, when you when you say that, you know, you, who, what your heritage is, that in some ways comedy is a way to disarm people about... Absolutely. Islam. It's a little easier for people to handle some of the Muslim quasi-terrorist types yeah. of jokes when you're yeah. me, and you're like, oh, look, isn't it funny, terrorist? You know, <laughs> like, it's totally different than, yeah. you know, a guy with a big yeah, beard yeah, yeah. and a fierce look in his eye. Yeah. But also, I mean, is, is it made sort of other comics suddenly jump in there as well, wanting to sort of talk about Iraq or, you know, Yeah, I mean, I think comics that. as a whole tend to be a little more political and, um, and a few have jumped into the mix yeah. in terms of um, taking liberties with making fun of, right. you know, Muslims and the Islamic religion a little bit more than in the past. Opening up the conversation, putting the stereotype on the table exactly. was in essence a way to break it down yeah. for people. Yeah. Like, I mean, when I do sort of the subtle stereotyping, I mean, I tell a cab driver joke and yeah. stuff like that. And, and my mom called me and said, you should tell people about the contributions that American Muslims have made to this economy. We are the most educated. We are the highest class people. And she got really sort of upset. Part of Ruby's act is offending people, and she's very good at it. If she wants to say that Jesus gives chocolate to children, she can. But the principles that underpin this freedom go way beyond providing material for comedians. They provide the basis for the law of this land and guarantee freedoms that are carved in stone. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. When people talk about the fundamental freedoms enshrined in the American Constitution, this is what they're talking about, the First Amendment. And it's the reason why so many American Muslims have been talking to me about the American Constitution, because in it, they are free to practice their religion as Muslims. And they are free to speak their mind, unlike so many Muslims in Muslim countries around the world. And if anybody tries to oppress them in this country, they can seek justice from the American government. The fundamental freedoms guaranteed under Islamic law are not far from these American ideals. And that's amazing when you realize the Quran predates the Constitution by a thousand years. And there's evidence in Washington that suggests America knows it's indebted to Islam for its own citizens' inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the Supreme Court in Washington. Now, we can't get into film because they're actually in session. But what I wanted to show you is a freeze, which is in the room where the Chief Justices actually sit and dispense justice. This freeze pays homage to the ideas and principles that have inspired the American legal system. And one of the foundation documents represented in this freeze is the Quran. And in the nation's capital, there are a few other references to Islam, largely unknown, rarely seen. The Thomas Jefferson Building contains the Library of Congress, the oldest cultural institution in Washington, which was completed in the 19th century. 
Around the dome of the reading room is a mural meant to represent the nations and ideas that contributed most to American civilization. And it might come as a surprise to historians that amongst the ideas represented here is Islam. Beneath this great mural, I'm meeting Congressman Keith Ellison, who I came across at the start of my journey in Minneapolis. So, Keith, tell me about when you took your oath of office, because it was on a copy of the Quran and not just any copy. Well, in fact, it was on this Quran that we have right here before us. And, uh, you know, in fact, uh, this Quran, which is a two volume set, mm -hmm. has the initials uh, TJ inscribed right here. Thomas Jefferson. And so, you know, we, we said this is... What was is your a, reaction when you found out that one of the founding fathers had his own copy of the Quran? Rake, I was gobsmacked. <laughs> As we'd say in Britain. As you'd say in Britain. It was huge. It, it was, was international. Um, I didn't have much appreciation for why it would be a big deal that a Muslim would be elected to the United States Congress. I thought the issue was going to be color. And I thought, wow, we've really made some great strides in terms of racial justice when people don't care that I'm black anymore. They just, they're just, they just want to talk about religion. But do you think, Keith, that for all the grassroots activism in the Muslim community, that at a national level, the fact is that most Americans are still afraid of Islam? Americans, I think, are subject to fear, just like any people in the world. But I think there's this deeply rooted tolerance uh, and people, and we've been through a momentous civil rights movement. We've been through all kinds of social change movements, all marching the country toward a greater level of equality. And I think people are just not ready to try to cut anybody out of the deal. But the fact is, in the European context, it's it, what it means to be a Brit or a Norwegian is fairly tightly defined. They wouldn't look like you and me on right. the whole. And, and, and what it means to be of that nation means you, you're, you're a certain color, a certain culture, a certain faith. Yes. But in America, we're coming all cultures, all colors, our faiths. Even the most conservative American does not question my authenticity as an American. Now, we impose social orthodox, I mean, hierarchies and economic hierarchies. We're not saying we have social justice heaven here. We don't. But, but the fact is, we don't question our authenticity as Americans. On this journey, I've met Muslims who've made me rethink my prejudices about America. Muslims here realize something the rest of the world and possibly other Americans have forgotten. This country was born out of a revolutionary moment. Settlers first came here fleeing religious persecution. They overthrew a colonial monarchy. They based their constitution on the ideals of the French Revolution and radical thinkers like Tom Paine, John Locke, and yes, the Prophet Muhammad. But there's a much more recent moment in American history that has come to define America's relationship with Islam. Thinking about America's relationship with Islam, like everybody else, I'm drawn immediately to one city and one moment. And the events of September the 11th, 2001, in New York City changed that relationship between America and Islam forever. And it must also have had an impact on American Muslims. In my next program, I look at how the events of that day affected them. Farouk Mohammed was with the New York City Fire Department on 9-11. There were Muslims like me there, you know. And who died and, as well. And some that died. Definitely Muslims died there, you know, trying to help others. James Yi was the Army's Muslim chaplain at Guantanamo Prison. Initially, I was being accused of espionage, spying, and aiding the enemy. Now, these are capital crimes for, in which military prosecutors even threatened me with the death penalty. And I explore whether a distinctly American form of Islam is emerging in the aftermath of 9-11. Arabic scholar Lale Bakhtia believes something unique is happening here. The voice of the Muslim woman has not been heard throughout the 1400 years of Islamic history. Now we need to hear from the women. And it's only when you live in America that you are empowered to go forth with your ideas. 